Well, hello out there. Welcome to 2021, our first Wednesday of the new year. Glad to see you all. I know you're out there. We have a lot in store for you this evening. There's a lot in store for us this year. Old things are passed away. All things are new. Tell somebody, say, it's a new year. It's a new season. It's a new day. Fresh anointings coming my way. The season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. And it's coming for you. It's coming for you. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's get into it because we're going to continue. Some of you may have been with us on, on Sunday. We're going to continue a little in that same vein. First, I want to officially welcome everyone, especially if you're a first-time viewer. We really want to welcome you here. We're Redeeming Love Christian Center. I'm Pastor Greg. Along with Pastor Ed, we're, we're both senior pastors here at Redeeming Love Christian Center. And as you know how to tell us apart, I'm the taller one. When you see them, you'll, you'll know what, what we mean. But if this is your first time viewing with, you know, joining us, why don't you put... Put a little hello in the comment section, send it to us, let us know who you are. And if you let us know how to get in touch with you, we'll do just that. We'll stay in touch with you and let you know all of the exciting things that will be going on here this year. Amen? Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. Thank you, Lord, because this is the day that you've made, and we have been rejoicing, and we have been glad in it. And we're so grateful for the victories that we've had today. We're so grateful for the answers, the problems and solutions and issues and challenges that, that you, you gave us today. It was an exciting day because here it is at the end of the day and we're still here, we're still alive, we're still kicking, we're still ready to go. And we thank you, Father, because we came out, we gathered around together because we want to hear more of your truth and we know that your word is all the truth that there is, the only truth that there is. So, Father, before I release the word that you gave me for these precious viewers this evening, as always, Father, I covet two things. First of all, Lord, regardless of the words that come out of my mouth, please let each person hear exactly what you need them to hear based on your purpose and plan for their lives as individuals, as members of the body at large, and in particular, Lord, as members of this congregation. And Father, I'm only going to say those things or do those things that you tell me to say or tell me to do, and I will not pull any punches so you won't have to pull me from your lineup. But when we leave here, we're going to be built up, we're going to be edified. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's, it's very important and very personal to me. That, that part in my opening prayer where I say, you know, I won't pull any punches. It's not that I'm afraid of him pulling me from the lineup. But when you pull a punch, you do so so your opponent can win. So if I hold back, if I don't give you all that God tells me to give you the way he tells me to give it to you, then I'm pulling my punches and putting you in a position where the enemy can win, and I will never knowingly do that. I'd like to believe I'd never unknowingly do that either because the Holy Ghost will just stop me. But that's why I say I will not pull any punches. I want you to get the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Amen? Amen. If you need a title, this is Run the Gauntlet, and this is part two. And this year, we're, for, for right now anyway, we're starting all of our teaching, at least I am, with Hebrews 12, the first three verses. So why don't you turn there? I'm using the, the Passion Translation for this, these passages. You can follow in whatever translation you have. It says, as for us, we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us, and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination, for the path has, already, has been already marked out before us. We look away from the natural realm, and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus, 
who birthed faith within us and who leads us forward into first faith's perfection. His example is this. Because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. We're just, we just came out of the year of a year that gave us a lot of opportunities to cave in to life's pressures. You know, with everything that's going on politically, socially, and, 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 and medically, it, 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 it's enough to make someone want to cry uncle, but we're not those who cry uncle. We cry Abba Father, and we keep on going. Now, every year, you know, I always ask God to give me something, you know, some indication of, of the path that he wants to take or the direction he wants to take or and things that will, will encourage and stimulate and motivate the people. And this is what he said to me. Tick-tock. The clock is moving. The return of Christ is close. Tick-tock. We're running out of time. There's still work to be done. The fields are white, but the laborers are few. Tick-tock. Too many hands off the plow. Too much looking back and looking at and not enough looking to, looking to Jesus. Tick-tock, get into all the world and preach the gospel. Get into all the world and live the gospel. Tick-tock, let my love be evident in you. Let my love be evident in you. Let my strength be manifested in you. Tick-tock, tick-tock, the clock is moving. What about you? Now, when you hear something like that, you have a couple of choices, that, a couple of directions you can go. You know, you can get discouraged and say, oh, God is just beating on me. No, he's not. He's encouraging us. He's letting us know the times that we're in. God never says anything to make his people feel badly. As a matter of fact, he put in his word, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit, not after the flesh. So as long as you're doing that, there is no condemnation. And if you read um, John 3, 16 and 17, you'll see where Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to rescue. He came to save. So since the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost will never condemn you, I'll never condemn you either. It doesn't matter to me what you do. We will never, never condemn you. Condemn you. But in that exhortation that, that the Lord gave me for you, is all of it's important, but one part just jumped out at me. And that's where he said, too many hands off the plow. Too much looking back and looking at and not enough looking to, meaning looking to Jesus. Now, he didn't say too many people looking back and they still have their hands on the plow because if you look at Luke 9, verse 62, Jesus said, no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So God wasn't saying you're not fit. What God was saying, he, he wasn't saying you're holding on, you have your hands in the plow, on the plow like you're doing my work but your heart's not there. You're looking back at other things that you would rather be doing. That's not what he was talking about when he gave me the word for us this year. He said, too many hands off the plow. What that means, folks, it's for whatever reason, we have our hands on the plow and we're going forward and something happens and we stop. We take our hands off the plow and we start looking at whatever it is that happened. We're stunned. We didn't expect anything to come up. We thought because we put our hands on the plow and we're moving forward, nothing's going to get in the way. Nothing's going to stop us. Nothing's going to hinder us. But that's not the way it is. I was speaking to someone with, with someone 
and we were talking about, you know, a, a particular problem or issue. And then I heard myself saying, and when I use that term, I heard myself saying, it's something that I wasn't really thinking about, but it just popped in. It, it, it just invaded, or, or as my generation would say, just bogarted its way into my thinking. And what it came, what the, what the, what the thought it was that came was this. It's not broken. That's why you can't figure out how to fix it. And I'm so, I was thinking, I was like, it's not broken. What does that mean? That means it's operating the way it's supposed to. That's just the way it is. And you're trying to fix something that's not broken. It can't be done. You wind up getting frustrated. You wind up getting discouraged. And you wind up being distracted. That verse Luke, that we read in Luke 9, verse 62, in the Living Bible, it says, but Jesus told him, anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work I planned for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. So when we, when we decide that we're going to try and fix something that's not broken, we're putting ourselves in a position where we can be distracted because we're trying to, to, to fix something that can't be fixed. So, well, what do you do? You just leave it broken? No. We're not supposed to fix it. We're supposed to overcome it. And there is a difference. We're supposed to overcome it. God said that too, that too many took their hands off the plow, and too many are looking back and looking, back, looking at because they're stunned by what's going on. They're overwhelmed by the enormity of the situation, and so they stop. They take their hands off the plow and they're wondering what's going on. I, I didn't think it would be like this. I've spoken the word. I've declared, I've decreed, and it appears that nothing's changing. And they get discouraged and they stop. They stop and they start looking for other sources either of information or other ways to do things that make sense naturally. Because we're just trying to figure out what's happening. We, th we think, we mistakenly think that we can speak the word and everything changes immediately. We see the manifestation, everything smooths right out, and we just go on without a care in the world. Well, that's just not the way it is. Have you ever heard of the term gauntlet? I was going to say raise your hand if you heard it, but I couldn't see your hands up anyway. <laughs> but you can type in the comments, I heard of it, and the, the operators will wave at me and let me know, yes, they heard of it. But gauntlet, the gauntlet used to be a, a, a military punishment. But now... What the gauntlet is, is this person has to run by a group of people. Usually, it's people on, on both sides. They have to run through like a couple of rows of people. And as they pass by, each person hits them as hard as they can with every, whatever weapon they could. And you don't have a weapon. And you have to go, go through this gauntlet and make it out through the other side. And if you make it out through the other side, you're considered to be a person of great honor. You get a rite of passage, you have your respect, you, 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 you're part of the group, you're one of the boys, because you ran the gauntlet, and you didn't quit, you didn't give up, even though you were attacked from all sides. And mind you, you have no physical weapons at all. But I saw something interesting, and I want you to, I want you to remember the the word gauntlet, because I'm, I'm, I may refer, as a matter of fact, I know I'm going to refer back to it at least two more times. But in, in Hebrews 12, 1, in the Passion Translation, it said, as for us, we have all of these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds. It didn't look, listen to what it says. So we must let go of every wound that has pierced us. We have to let go of every wound that's pierced us. 
we have to let go of the things people have done to us that hurt us. And the fact that the word says we must let go tells us something, at least it told me something that I had never thought about. The only way that wound can stay is if, I, if, if I'm holding on to it. Say, well, why do you say that, Pastor Greg? Because the word says we must let go of every wound. So that means if I don't let it go, it stays with me. And as long as it stays with me, sin has something to attach itself to. But if I let go of the wound, anything that's attached to the wound or wants to be attached to the wound goes with it. And then when it comes at me, there's nothing for it to, to latch on to. So I can walk around sinless. I can walk around with, 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 without any frustrations. I can walk around without any fear because I have let go of that wound. And see, the, the, the danger in that is because when we think of the wound, we normally think about something in the flesh, something that hit our flesh, opened our flesh, and there was bleeding or, you know, whatever comes out. But I want us to understand that a wound, by definition, is also an injury or hurt to your feelings, to your sensibility, to things that make sense to you. A wound can be something that attacks what makes sense to you, leaving you confused. It, it, a wound, your reputation can be wounded. There are a number of things about us that, that are susceptible to wounds, but the wound is not what's important. What's important is what we do when, when, when we get wounded. Do we hold on to it and nourish it, or do we let it go? And you probably wonder, what do you mean by nourishing the wound? Well, you nourish a wound by talking about it. You go around talking to people saying, look what happened to me, or this is what happened to me, or I don't know why this happened to me, or it keeps happening to me. You know, everything's happening, 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 happening. And meanwhile, that, moon keep, that, that wound keeps taking it in and taking it in. And, you know, if you ever noticed you get a wound, a little sore, and it starts to heal, and a covering goes over, a little scab, and if you leave it alone, it's all right. After a few days or weeks, it'll just fall off, and you won't even know if it's there. But if you start picking at it, it gets infected. And you, you know, you squeeze the pus out, you pick at it, and you pull the scab off, and you look at it, it now it's a little deeper. And the more you pick at it, the deeper it gets, and the more dangerous the results of it can get. If you leave it alone and ignore it, it will heal. And it won't even look like you had one. Well, it's the same way spiritually. When we get wounded, if we keep picking at it by talking about it and complaining it, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper, and we get to the point where we can't move. So we take our hand off the plow because we don't understand why this wound won't go away. And it's painful. It's uncomfortable. So we figure, well, let me just stop until I can figure out what's going on. Let me just stop so I can figure out what's wrong. Nothing's wrong. It's happening the way it's supposed to happen. Circumstances come. My one and only call to the late Pastor Clinton Utterbach, when something was going on, I called and I was an emotional wreck. I was crying and telling them the devil's doing this and the devil's doing that. And I was, I was brand new. You know, I was, I was less than a year old as a believer. Not natural age, but as a believer, I was less than a year old. And I called the office, and, and Pastor Clinton got on the phone, and he said to me, I took this call because I know you're, you're new, meaning that I was, I was a new Christian. He said, so I'll stop planning for 2,000 people to talk to you. Well, that, that made me feel pretty small right there. And then he didn't offer the fatherly advice in, in the sense that, you know, he's like, you pat your hand on his shoulder and say, don't worry about it, it's going to be all right. No, he said to me, 
I don't ever want to hear you talking about what the devil's doing again. He said, the devil's doing what he's supposed to do because he's the devil. But if you start doing what you're supposed to be doing as a Christian, then what the devil's doing won't matter. I said, yes, sir. He hung up the phone. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> that was it. That wound that I was carrying and, and holding so preciously, I just let it go. I just let it go. I said, I'm not going to have that type of call ever again. And then I started looking at the word to find out what he meant by the devil's doing what he's supposed to do. And we're going to look at that just a, a little bit because it's important. It's important. In John 3, verse 18, in the Message Bible, because I want us to understand that a wound that's been nourished will allow unbelief and uncertainty to enter in. And that, that's what happened with me. Because I was focusing on what was happening. I was having doubts and un of unbelief, and I was uncertain. Maybe the word isn't for me, or maybe I'm not old enough yet, or, or, or something. It says, anyone who trusts in him, meaning trust in Jesus, is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust him has long since been under the death, death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God would introduce to him. I hadn't taken the time to really find out who Jesus is and who I am in Christ. So I wasn't sure. I knew it worked for people like, like the pastor, like Pastor Clinton. They were veteran believers. But I thought that I had to, you know, move up in, in levels and I, I, that, that I just wasn't old enough to face a, quote-unquote, mature demon. And I allowed myself to get distracted, and I thought something was wrong with me. But look at Genesis 1, 26 and 28. I saw this today for the, for the very first time, as many times as we, I've read Genesis. This is in the Message Bible. As God spoke, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature. And I started wondering, well, what, why was that important for God to make human beings in his image and reflecting their nature? Well, he says so in the next sentence. So they can be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds in the air and the cattle and, yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. So God knew... Well, let me say it this way. If God was going to create man and put man in the garden, and the garden was just immediately going to be obedient to man, why would God have to say, I have to make them like, like us, like the Godhead, so they can be responsible? If that were the case, if the animals and everything was going to just immediately obey whoever God put there, he could have made them in any image and likeness he wanted to. But he knew in order for man to do what man was supposed to do, man had to resemble God. He said God created human beings, he created them godlike. He didn't create mankind to be a bunch of wimpy, mealy mouthed, scared people. He created mankind to be just like him. Mankind was supposed to be like God the Father, like God the Son, like God the Holy Ghost. And then, and God knew that, and the reason he had to make man like that, well, let, let, me, let me read the next part, and I'll tell you it then. God created human beings. He created them God-like, reflecting God's nature. He created them male and female. God blessed them. Now, listen to this. He said, prosper, reproduce, fill the earth, take charge. Be responsible. And I'm thinking, why does he have to tell man to do that? If he made man and put man in the garden, what's there to be responsible for? God made all the creatures, so everybody's going to be is going to cooperate. Wrong. God knew that everyone would not cooperate, and so he needed to put someone in the garden 
who would take control, maintain order, keep things operating the way it was supposed to, and he decided it was going to be mankind. So we were created from the beginning to take control and not be under the control of those we're supposed to be in control over. That's like having a household run by children. And the parents and babysitters and, and all of the adults are, are run by the children. Well, what's that, that secular term that you were, were, were running the, the inmates running the asylum? It would be like that. But God, the fact that God said prosper, reproduce, is telling us that mankind could have been in a position where they weren't prospering. It means that prosperity was going to be attacked, and God is saying, prosper. But this is happening, but this is happening, but this is happening. Prosper. And he'll keep saying prosper until we say, okay, and we start to prosper. That means that no matter what comes, no matter how it comes, we've been given the ability and the right and the command to prosper, to reproduce, to fill the earth, to take charge, to be responsible. So God gave us that from the very beginning, folks. So why do we allow ourselves to be wounded? Because things come up that and want to act like they're in control. And we're not. We have to know who we are. We were created to act like God. Period. And creation, all of creation was made to be in submission to God. So God knew that there was potential there for his man to be challenged by circumstances. And he already gave us, told us what to do about it. Prosper. He didn't say prosper if conditions are right. He didn't say be responsible if everybody likes you. He didn't say take charge if the people let you. No, he said, I made you in my image and after my likeness, prosper. Take charge, be responsible. And we need, to, we need to understand that even though we're going to be challenged. Even, I'm going to, let me read you what, the way he said it. So what he was saying was that even though I've given you dominion and authority. Some are not going to recognize it. You exercise dominion and authority anyway. You operate in your authority anyway, and you don't concern yourself with what your adversary thinks about it. See, we take our hands off the plow because we're concerned about what people are saying. We need to be concerned about what God said, because there are a couple of things that God, well, there are a lot of things that God said, but the, the two strongest ones for me is Luke 10, 19. Those of you that have been around me know I, I practically use this scripture almost every time I'm in front of you. It's from the Amplified Classic. Jesus said, Behold, I have given you authority and power to trample upon serpents and scorpions and physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses, and nothing shall in any way harm you. That means that, that, that the enemy, folks, has, has nothing physical or mental, or physically or mentally that's more powerful than what we've been given by Christ. There's nothing that the enemy can come up with that's more powerful than what we've been given in Christ. In 2 Corinthians 12, Verse 7 to 9, again in the Amplified Bible, the Apostle Paul said, And to keep me from being puffed up and too much elated by the exceeding greatness, preeminence of these revelations, there was given me a thorn, a splinter in the flesh. You could say it was given me a wound. And it tells you what it was, a messenger of Satan to rack and buffet and harass me to keep me from being excessively exalted. This next part is key to me. It always has been every time, and I, it, it's highlighted to me every time I read this passage. Three times 
I called upon the Lord and besought him about this and begged that it might depart from me. And I realized when that happened, when, when Paul got hit with this thorn, when Paul got this wound, he took his hands off the plow and started looking at the wound and complaining about the wound not going into all the world and preaching the gospel. He didn't do anything for the kingdom. He didn't do anything to further the cause of Christ while he was complaining about that wound. And we need to take a lesson from that. He wasn't being fruitful. He wasn't, being mul he wasn't multiplying the kingdom. He wasn't subduing anything. He was complaining about what the enemy was doing to him. And look how God responded in verse 9. That's why I like the Amplified Version. He said to me, my grace, my favor and loving kindness and mercy is enough for you. Sufficient against any danger and enables you to bear the trouble manfully. Notice it didn't say to eliminate. It didn't say to get rid of. It said to bear. So we're going after that. Paul's going after that like it's something broken. It's not broken. It's the enemy acting like the enemy. And we can't do, we can't change that. But what we can do about it is bear it. Endure it. Go, th go through it. That's, the, that's what I mean by run the gauntlet. Yes, it's going to come. It's going to be there. And nothing we can do will stop it. It's going to come. Remember, Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations. Not you might have. He said, you will have. So why are we trying to pray it away? He said, he that endures to the end, the same shall be saved. So that means things are coming that we're not going to be able to stop, but we're going to be able to go through. Many are the afflictions of the righteous. But what does the Lord do? He delivers us out of them all. But we have to go through them. And it says that it, it, it's, it's sufficient against danger and enables us to bear the trouble manfully. For my strength and power are made perfect, fulfilled and completed, and show themselves most effective in your weakness. How is that so? Because when you have your hands on the plow and something is in your path trying to stop you, then the scripture, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, kicks in and empowers you to keep going. And the stronger the opposition gets, the more powerful you become. As long as you're not holding on to the wound. You have to let the wound go because power and the wound don't mix. Power is not going to attach itself to the wound. You have to let it go. That's why the scripture says, let go of every wound. When we let it go, the power of God comes over us. Which means, which has to mean that when we became new creatures in Christ Jesus, Everything that we needed to let go, we got. So we don't have to say, God, give me the strength to let go. We just have to let go because he's already given us the strength to do it. When did he give us that strength? When he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it. When he said it, everything we needed to do it, we got. And then when we came in Christ, then Christ gave us all the power that he had. So we have what we got in the beginning, and we have what we got when we, when we made the choice to be in Christ. So you can say we're double powerful. But either one is enough for us to run the gauntlet and finish the job that we were called to finish.
2 Corinthians 10, verse 4, tells us about this, this power that we have. In the New Life Version, it says, We do not use those things to fight with that the world uses. We use the things God gave us to fight with, and they have power. That's why the things that the world is trying to do to overcome the conditions of this world ain't working. Because believers are not fighting with spiritual weapons. They're trying to fight with natural weapons, and it's not working. Why? We're not designed to use them. We do not use those things to fight with that the world uses. We use things God gives to fight with, and they have power. Those things God gives to fight with destroy the strong places of the devil. But what did God give us? His word. I shared it with you before, but Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. But listen to what it says in the Passion Translation. I need to start in verse 12 in the Passion Translation. Paul said, I know what it means to lack. And I know what it means to experience overwhelming abundance. For I'm trained in the secret of overcoming all things, whether in fullness or in hunger. And I find that the strength of Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. That lets me know, well, I'll say it in these terms. When I played, was, was playing basketball, and I, like I said, I was a basketball player. I didn't just play basketball. And I'm in the crowd under the basket, and someone shoots the ball, and it's a loose ball. I want to get it. I can't just jump. I have to explode up because I have to go get past other people trying to get the same thing I'm going after. So I can't just casually jump. I had to have, I had to develop explosive power. But well, one minute I'm on the, on, on the court, next minute I'm in the air grabbing a rebound or putting a rebound back in. That's something I had to develop. How do you develop it? By using it and using it and using it. You get stronger and stronger and stronger, and it's like you have rockets, you know, on your legs where something comes and they just ignite and just power you up. Well, that's what this verse is, 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 is talking about. Christ's explosive power infuses me to conquer every difficulty. Why would we need explosive power if we were never going to have any difficulty? Things are going to go wrong. It's not broken. That's the way it's supposed to act. And then now we're supposed to act like we're believers and let our explosive power conquer that thing. We've been given a job to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Well, we're running the gauntlet because we're not, the devil's not going to let us do that comfortably. There are going to be folks there with weapons to try and knock us down, and we have to go. We can't go around the gauntlet. We have to go through. So, folks, it's, it, you're not broken when you experience these things. Your faith is not broken when you experience these things. You need to know that you were built to handle it. I know I can't hear you, but say, I was built to handle it. I, say, I was built to handle it. And if the Godhead can handle anything that the Godhead can handle, we were made to handle because we were made in that same image and after that same likeness. Hebrews 12, again, first three verses. As for us, we have all these great witnesses who encircle us like clouds, so we must let go of every wound that has pierced us and the sin we so easily fall into. Then we will be able to run life's marathon race with passion and determination. For the path has, has already been marked out before us. And we look away from the natural realm and we fasten our gaze onto Jesus, 
who birthed faith within us, who leads us forward into faith's perfection. His example is this, because his heart was focused on the joy of knowing that you would be his, he endured the agony of the cross and conquered its, this, its humiliation and now sits exalted at the right hand of the throne of God. So consider carefully how Jesus faced such intense opposition from sinners who oppose their own souls so that you won't become worn down and cave in under life's pressures. Folks, again, you are not broken. Your faith is not broken. Everything is happening the way it's supposed to happen. The forces of darkness know how to do their job. They're making us think that there's something wrong with us, that we can't handle it. Well, yes, we can. We just have to be willing to run the gauntlet knowing, knowing that everything that we need to endure was provided to us really in the Garden of Eden. But certainly when we became new creatures in Christ, when old things were passed away and all things have become new and all things are of God. We've been given power to tread on snakes and scorpions, physical and mental strength and ability over all the power that the enemy possesses. So when his power shows up, our power is already in place. It's not that the devil shows up and we have to, you know, I can't whistle like that, but just whistle, power, I need you now. No, we walk around infused with the power of God. So we say, tick-tock, the clock is moving, the return of Christ is, of Christ is close. Tick-tock, we're aware of the time, and we're aware of the work that needs to be done. Yes, the fields are white, but we're in there laboring as laborers harvesting. Tick-tock, all hands are on the plow. No one is looking back or looking at circumstances or obstacles. We're all looking to Jesus because he brought us in and is perfecting our faith. Tick tock. We're all in the world and preaching the gospel. We're all in the world and living the gospel. Tick tock. The love of God is evident in us. The strength Christ gave us is manifested in us. Tick tock. The clock is moving and we're in sync with it. We're running the gauntlet and there's nothing the enemy can do to stop us. And as a matter of fact, there's one more. Tick tock, devil, your time is about up. Everyone say, tick tock, devil, your time is just about up. Father, we thank you. We give you all glory, honor, and praise. Thank you for the word that you've shared with us. Thank you for letting us know that there's nothing wrong with us. We're not broken. Everything is happening the way you said it was happening. We're just up against the powers of darkness, and we were using the wrong weapons. Now we know what we should be using. And now we understand that it's not broken. It's operating the way it's supposed to operate. We need to do the same. Thank you, Father, that by your Holy, that your Holy Spirit will, will, will unveil this message, will give revelation to the hearers. Every time they think about it, they're going to see another revelation of, as to who they are and what they have and how they can run this gauntlet no matter what happens. No one can stop them. No one can stop them. Thank you, Father, that in the beginning, when you created the heavens and the earth, your intent was to create us to be in charge of the heavens and the earth. Thank you, Lord, for all you've done and are doing for us so that we will be successful. We will complete the job you've called us to complete, and we'll do it in your time frame. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, before I let you go, two, two quick things. First of all, in order to operate in all the power 
given to us by Christ, you have to receive Christ. You have to receive Christ. You can't benefit from him until you receive him. And you do that by just saying a brief confession, because the word says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you're saved. So real quick, just, just, everyone, just, just say, Father God, I believe that you're God, and I believe Jesus Christ is your son. Jesus, I believe you are everything that the Bible says you are. I believe you went to the cross and died for the sins of mankind. I believe you were buried and went to hell in man's place. And after three days in hell, I believe God raised you from the dead. And now you're seated on his right hand and that you're coming again soon. Well, I turn to you, Lord, and I call, I call you, Lord. And I'm asking you to come into my life, come into my heart. I turn from my past ways as an act of repentance, and I've turned towards you, and I'm asking you to make something new of me, and it's your name that I pray. Well, folks, if, if anyone out is out there and you made that confession for the first time, you believed it, you just got born again, we put the contact information on, on the screen, just contact us. I, I prayed with Pastor Greg, and now I'm born again. Please send me some information, and that's exactly what we'll do. We'll send you some free information, letting you know just what happened tonight and who you've become and now who you are in Christ. And also, if I shared something tonight and you didn't quite understand or you, you have a comment you want, you want to say to me about it, use the same contact information. And I promise you, I will get back to you. It may not be the same day, but I will get back to you. And before I let you go, again, on behalf of Pastor Red, we, we, we thank God for you and the support that you show toward this ministry. It's, 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 it really is. I don't use this word much, but it really is overwhelming. When we look at the, the, the offerings and the gifts that come in and the comments that, that, that you make when you send it, it just warms our hearts. So, you know, we, we've put on the screen the ways that, that you can support the ministry. You know, our preference really helps us if you use one of the electronic methods instead of walk-in or mail. But if you have to mail or walk-in, that, that's fine also. But we I just want to tell you, God said in Malachi 3 that when you bring all the tithe into the storehouse, he'll open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. And the devourer will be rebuked for your sake. He says we'll be a delightsome land. So we thank you for your giving. And Father, right now, I just want to thank you for the generosity and the obedience of the people to give to this ministry for kingdom building. We thank you, Father, that they love you and they love Redeeming Love Christian Center and they want to see Redeeming Love Christian Center fulfill your purpose for the people in this area to train up men and women to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. Thank you for their generosity and their partnership. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thank you for allowing me to share with you tonight, and we'll see you next time.